You, you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Let's discover a couple months, but it's in this is enough so you can know what's up in the hood. Art has always been a way for people to express themselves. Art's education has always been deemed as important, but it's always been treated as otherwise. Rahm Emanuel and other CPS officials promised that all students across the city would receive an education in the arts. In 2014, Raise Your Hand Illinois conducted a survey and collected data from about 170 Chicago public elementary schools. They discovered that 65% of those schools don't offer the minimum two hours of arts education per week. My name is Gregory Buckner. I'm 17. I go to Shy Arts. Um, my name is Zion, and I am an, a dance major. Tyler Jackson. I'm 17 years old. I go to the, the Chicago High School of the Arts. My name is Armani Howard. I am 22 years old. Um, I am a working artist. With dance, um, there are different types. So each type, I dance in contemporary, modern, jazz, and lyrical. And in those dances, my emotions, they influence my moves. So that's how I express myself. I feel like throughout any like style I use, like painting, drawing, illustrating, or anything graphic, uh, color is usually something that's very uh, consistent. I usually consistently use the same uh, color palette uh, to enforce like my ideas. Get in like the idea of like what my style is one, but then also just experimenting with it and experimenting with like the influence of other styles, experimenting with like just like all the different types of art that's out there because like within it, it goes back into like your own work. So if you go out into the world and you experience new things and I kind of use that loosely. It doesn't actually have to be just like painting. It could be like food, it could be music, it could be someone's culture, like that's all art. So if you go out and you experience as many of those different things as you can, then that's gonna eventually influence your art because you're now taking in so much new stuff that you can take inspiration from. You're taking so many new factors of the world that you're living in to like experience the work itself and it's and just art. If that was the mindset we had for everything, the things around us we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have cameras, we wouldn't have planes, we wouldn't have any of that stuff. I get a little bit upset because with art you're supposed to express yourself. Like what am I supposed to be doing then? Like if I'm not doing this, is there like something I should be doing? I, believe, I really don't care what anybody else say because like if you want to do it, you should do it because it's your life, it's all about you. It's not no about what anybody else thinks about you. That's also why I chose dancing, because with dance, there are no limitations, and I can express my way, myself in any other way. Like, I'm not gonna like conform to like what I'm supposed to be doing, because that's like an idea that doesn't really exist. So like, it's, it's, it kinda goes into like a whole nother story of things, but like, it's just that person's personal fear. And like, they don't do that in their own life. So yes, because you are both in the same world of things. Like, if you want to try something that you think that, yes, it may be a lot of work, just do it. Just try it. Like, that's, I don't know, that's just like, to me, that's just like the most demeaning thing you could do to someone. If someone's trying to do something that just because it's not the conventional way. Like, yes, it's not science. Like, you can blow something up if you don't chemically do it right. But like, besides that, you should be able to try anything. Like. Just because you're at a certain level doesn't mean that you can't like just keep shooting for something bigger. Cause then it's like, what are you gonna do at that point? What inspired me to dance was when I was five years old and I was in my first recital. I guess after that, I always wanted to be a dancer. And since I was told I couldn't say certain things growing up and I couldn't do such things growing up, 
I chose dance because with dance, I can do whatever I want and no one can tell me what I can and can't do. Um, like, just looking at different stuff on the media, like, if I really like to see what they're doing and I really want to go for it, it, like, inspires me to actually, like, push myself to do it because I just feel like we can do anything that we put our mind to. So, and what really inspires me is myself, to be honest, because I believe I can do whatever I want. So, yeah. At first, it was just like the possibility of like what I can do. Um, seeing like a painting for the first time, seeing like artwork for the first time, and just like realizing that like a human did that. And I don't, I don't know, I just don't want to make this seem like it's very cheesy, but like at this point now, it's like completely different. I want to like see how many people I can like positively influence in the world. When I was younger, uh, my elementary school didn't have art class for at least five years. So, and I really didn't have like, like a lot of people in my school didn't have a, a lot of experience with art and art can portray your feelings in so many different ways. It was kind of cheesy though. It was like, a, like you use Crayola and like, and like that even now I've gotten older and I've been able to appreciate those like, like those materials. Cause like, yeah, it's like, it's color principles. It's still something you can create artwork with, but like we also had art teachers that weren't very like, thought inducing like they weren't like it was just kind of one of those things where it's like here's some construction paper here's some crazy scissors some glue and colored pencils have fun and like yeah it almost becomes like yeah like it almost just becomes like a joke like the way school approaches art it almost it's like a joke the way they treat it so we did but I wouldn't now that I know what art is I wouldn't consider it an art class when I was in elementary school, I had an art class pretty much from when I started until I was in about the seventh grade when I guess like CPS, like budget got cut or whatever. So like, I've had an art class for a majority of my life. There were like maybe two or three years where I didn't because you know, since I go to art school, I kind of have that extra education. But outside of that, no, not really. Yeah, I feel like um, I feel like school should um, provide an arts education, like even not just in art, but like like bring back art classes and like dance classes, like music classes, just because I feel like I feel like if kids who like there are a lot of kids who aren't exposed to like those type of things, and if they had that exposure, then they would feel you know more open to express themselves, and they would be less into like social media and like stuff that kind of distracts you from the world outside. Like, I feel like art classes would just help you gain an appreciation for, um, for kind of like the world around you. At least like get the idea of like what you can do with art and like what's the possibilities of it. Um, there should be more of like a, like a realistic focus of it. The only thing is, is that a lot of people, like a lot of teachers and instructors, like it's kind of sad because like art is a very like, it should be a very unbiased and open thing, but a lot of like art teachers can tend to be very limiting. Like once like a, like a younger artist or just anyone who's younger, they just think that it's like, you can only do so much at that point in time. And like, yes, that's true. Your art gets refined over time. You're becoming more experienced and become better the older you get. But it's just limiting if like you're shooting for this artist at a very young age to like, mold that so that way when you do get older you're even better than what you were when you were younger like i it should be it should be like a it should be mandatory almost like as much as we have like gym and like math and all those things it should definitely be mandatory but it should be refined and like i don't know they should just go back to the drawing board with it and just like treat it as if it was one of those other classes people have always had different ways of expressing themselves and within those communities boundaries have been set thus holding them back and telling them that they can't work outside of their chosen medium. The people shown here are not bothered by what people say and do it anyways because it's what they love to do. Hopefully, city officials will one day recognize how, many, how much of an impact art can have on a student. Art is like, it's kind of like, 
at this point in time where it's like undermined and like how powerful it is, but you can like change someone's life with art. Someone can look at something and can be from a certain area and like just because they looked at something that they didn't understand and it touched them, they're now influenced to like want to go do something. So the letters of STEM stand for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And it's a program in, um, it's a short way to describe a program in schools focusing on science and math, technological uh, subjects, and how they connect to each other. To have projects and things which call upon uh, practices you learn, calling upon, you know, things you might learn in, in science or in, in biology or physics, and, and applying those to solve practical problems. STEM education is defined as the teaching and learning in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that includes educational activities across all grade levels. Um, define it in a nutshell. I mostly teach. I teach calculus, pre-calculus, algebra 2 is what I teach right now. The American educational community has really started to focus on STEM because of the increasing need for competent people in the STEM careers. Um, and we have seen that, um, you know, there still are not enough people going into those careers and our need for people in those careers just continues to increase as a nation. Calculus is about studies of how things change, how you can uh, look at, how you can add up things over time. Um, but I think an important part of what calculus is it's a gateway to a lot of uh, different things you might study in college or different jobs you might want. Um, aside from what it is in its own self, it's a thing that can open doors for you or close them if you don't do calculus. Some people argue that adding art to the group provides more creativity and connectivity with the other letters. Some also argue that STEM subjects already have the arts involved and integrate it into STEM lessons. Can adding the arts to the acronym incentivize you to engage more into this field? Let's find out. Interesting. There is certainly a push to make STEM into STEAM by adding art. Yeah, I mean, well, I think it makes it all-encompassing. I mean, that sounds like almost all learning. Some people also worry that with a focus on STEM, it is sometimes to the exclusion of other things, like art and history and social sciences. So it's kind of a way to get there, um, to make sure that stuff is not ignored. There is an art to anything. If you know a lot about a certain topic, you know, it, it becomes an art. But I'm sure that does make it appeal to more kids. I think there are probably kids who say, oh, I'm not good with, you know, I'm not so sure about science and math. I'm not good at those. I haven't had success in those. So it might make them more appealing. Science is defined as such knowledge or such a system of knowledge concerned with the physical world and its phenomena. Science plays a heavy concentration on the scientific method to test, evolve, experiment, and present hypotheses and theories. Examples of science are space sciences, earth sciences, life sciences, chemistry, and physics. Mathematics is defined as the science of numbers and their operations. Mathematics is a technical foundation of science, technology, and engineering, and it involves finding data patterns or abstract logic to test mathematical relationships and to model the real world. Examples of mathematics are algebra, statistics, calculus, game theory, and geometry.
No, I really think just a part of just learning well is, is just going, doing experiments on things you're curious about, you know? Anything that, any way that you can apply uh, the knowledge you learn to something practical, I think is, is how people learn. We're putting the focus on STEM, you know, and kind of really focusing on math and science education, especially for women and for minority groups. Um, tend to go less into those fields, um, that, you know, that is going to guarantee a more diverse workforce in these really cutting edge, high technology fields where America is the leader. Uh, sure, if kids are interested in it, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of our um, society, there's a lot of school, there's a lot of jobs that revolve around STEM. So I think uh, kids are doing themselves a favor if they take advantage of that, if they get to know about it. Jobs involved in computers, math, architecture, engineering, life sciences, physical sciences, and social sciences are in the realm of STEM. You know, if you look at, for, for me personally, if I look at the things that, uh, you know, I, I've gotten the most uh, enjoyment out of, it's, it's, you know, following my curiosity. So I think that as long as you can do that, if, if that relates to STEM, that's... it will. I mean, think about how much of our world revolves around technological things. I mean, our interview right here is using how much high tech. Uh, you know, the GPS I used to get here. The, so much of our world revolves around technology. Um, if you look at, um, like the Department of Labor does a survey about what are the best jobs, the best professions. The top, out of the top 20, maybe 18 of them revolve around science, science or medicine. We more engineers, more scientists, more coders, more people that are able to innovate in technology, and also people that are able to be educated end users of the technology. Technology is defined as a manner of accomplishing a task, especially using technical processes, methods, or knowledge. Examples of technology are computer and information sciences, operating systems, artificial intelligence, programming, cryptography, and mobile computing. Technology connects people, making all forms of communication. Engineering is defined as the application of science and mathematics by which the properties of matter and the sources of energy in nature are made useful to people. Engineering involves developing systems, structures, products, or materials. Examples of engineering are aerospace, petroleum, civil, mechanical, industrial, electrical, and materials. I think that a lot of things are focused more on technology. Obviously, you know, you have things such as this this piece of junk in the garbage in the in the water right now, picking up garbage. You know, something like this is just completely based on uh, you know a applications of science and technology in such a way that it becomes readily accessible to everybody. So, from things down to here to you know uh, anything more complex, I think it requires those types of skills. Definitely, we're really a leader in the innovation but not in manufacturing anymore. So we need to still have kids that can innovate and lead and, and continue that process that the companies have started already here in the United States. News. My name is Justice. And I'm Devana. Since our organization, Community TV Network, is located on the northern edge of Humble Park, we decided to produce a news segment about the history in Humble Park. Let's take a look at how Humble Park has evolved through its 157 year history. Humble Park became a part of Chicago in 1869. In the coming decades, large numbers of German, Scandinavian, and Italian immigrants moved in from neighborhoods to the east. 
Other nationalities, including Ukrainians, Polish, and Russian Jews, began to also move into Humboldt Park. By the 40s, the population grew to 80,000 residents. This was the highest number of residents living in Humboldt Park. With such a diverse history, Humboldt Park's community has always been a mixture of different languages, foods, traditions, and art. On several streets, you can see beautiful murals that tell the history of the community. Many of the murals date back to the 1970s, and some are the oldest public art murals still in existence in the country. Murals tell a story of struggle, survival, and equality. Humboldt Park is widely known for its Puerto Rican population, but over the years, population has declined more than 23% from 1990 to 2000. But let's think about the community as a whole. What actually makes up a community, and how has it changed? Good question, Justice. Let's go to Max for asking that very question. Thanks, Justin and Devana. I'm Max. I'm about to interview a few people around the neighborhood and ask about how safe it used to be. My experience is when I first moved to Humboldt Park 10 years ago. At first, I felt, um, I didn't feel as comfortable living here. I felt like I couldn't walk through the actual Humboldt Park, um, like the boathouse area. I couldn't walk through there, uh, definitely not at night. And then also, um, you know, even during the day, I felt unsafe. When I moved to Humboldt Park, it was terrible because you had to be, excuse me, excuse me, can I come through to the gangbangers? You could get shot just walking outside, even if it wasn't for you. You know, these guys, they just would shoot each other from across the street. But life in the neighborhood has been improving. The community is getting together. And uh, having so many lawyers, uh, judges, uh, police officers, and people willing to be working with the community, that makes the difference. The community makes uh, crime levels go down, um, more activity, more programs like this, uh, more youth involvement like you guys makes community a better place. I personally am glad to see that the community is getting better. I've seen it go from a really bad neighborhood uh, to actually very livable. This is now an upcoming neighborhood people want to live here, you know. You talked about the gentrification. Is that happening now here? Oh, totally. I mean, if you look, um, one block behind us is Haddon. Um, it used to be really, really bad neighborhood. You know, if you look now, it's all condos. You know, what happens is someone buys a condo, property tax in the area goes a little higher. People who have lived here forever, even if they own the house, you know, and they're just paying the taxes, can no longer afford to pay the taxes. So they're kind of forced to to sell the house and then another condo comes from there. So, you know, you kind of have to, uh, kind of have to have some kind of money to live in the neighborhood now. The people that live like across the border in the, in Wicker, in the Wicker Park area, they come over here a lot. Uh, there's restaurants that have opened up that cater to more healthy eating. And so that brings people in. The rents are more affordable than other surrounding areas. And so that makes people, you know, come here. Um, and so it becomes more diversified. Brand new condominiums that they are making and a lot of different people moving in, that makes a lot of difference. I think that people from other areas, like say Wicker Park, Lakeview, uh, even Logan Square, <laughs> they get priced out of the rental rates and so they come here looking for something a little more affordable and you know it's still within it's close to downtown close to um, you know all the public transportation so it's nice to live here ideally i would like for the puerto ricans to still be able to stay in the neighborhood you know uh, but definitely we all have to work together to you know to, to stay together in peace and harmony We've been here, I want to just say, 25 years. So the name of this barbershop is uh, Hayuya Barbershop. Um, and Hayuya is just a small town in Puerto Rico, right in the center, mountainous region. So all of us in this barbershop, most of us are from Hayuya, so we're all uh, hibaros, which is kind of like saying uh, hibbly, you know, but a Puerto Rican hibbly, you know. So. I lived in Humble Park for 10 years. This bike shop, uh, has been at this location for five years. Before this location used to be on North Avenue and Campbell. Now we're on Division and Campbell. Home is right here. Uh, but I want to say home is here in Humble Park. You know, I'm not going to leave this neighborhood. You know.
I have a condo here on uh, Mozart and Cortez, and it's really expensive, you know. So I had to get two other roommates to help pay, you know, because I want to stay here. I refuse to go anywhere else where I don't know anybody, I don't know the community, especially since I'm, I walk out and everybody knows me. You know, I go to Eddie's, I get my free coffee, you know, but I support his network, so it's technically not free, you know. But this is definitely home. When I walk here, I feel like I know everybody, I know everything, I know every every uh, every corner, every crack, every gangway, you know. This is definitely, definitely home. Yeah. Yeah. But that's all we have for today. This is Hardcover News. See you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.